Today's stories are on the Seamen of Reddit. If you like my material, please hit that subscribe button as it definitely helps out the channel. Thanks guys. My fear wasn't for my safety, but for the safety of the guy on the other boat. A few years back, my dad and I had just tied up as a nor'easter was rolling in. We were on one of the docks along the Long Island Sound, the part of coast adjacent to Long Island, New York, which was notorious for bad storms. I don't remember the exact details of how we got into this, but turns out some guy hadn't returned to the docks dockmaster, who was friends with my pops, asked him to go out looking in this horrible storm. My dad, being the thick-skulled gung-ho adventurous man that he is, agreed to go looking in this terrible storm. Our boat could handle it. He had gone through many storms before with no problem. Our boat had two outriggers that served as stabilizers so capsizing wasn't a big concern. However, the boat we were looking for was a tiny center console that was maybe 25 feet long. And to mail it better, the guy had no kind of GPS or locator on him. He didn't even have a radio. We were literally looking around in the dark for him for an hour. Luckily, as we were passing a little bay, he had the sense to grab one of his flares and fire it off after he saw our lights. And we were able to get within shouting range. Now, if that wasn't enough, this guy had really just thrown safety out the window. We shouted for him to put on a life vest. Turns out he had none on the vessel, nor did he have a life raft. To make it worse, his anchor chain wasn't a chain, but a single rotting dock line, so his anchor snapped. Coupled with the fact that the waves were slowly pushing him towards the rocky shores, he was lucky we found him. Our original plan was to attempt a tow, but the conditions were so bad we couldn't get close enough without risking a collision. We had to wait there for the Coast Guard to hone in on our beacon since they had no way of locating this guy's boat, and they were able to retrieve him. Thankfully, his monstrosity of a boat crashed against the rocks after he had been carted away. The scary thing is that he had his eight-year-old son on the boat with him the whole time. We were on a D7 patrol off the coast of Cape Cod, and the fog was ridiculous. Like see three feet ahead and that's it, and our horn was on five second blasts. It's hard for the lookout to see much, and our radar has a hard time picking up anything under 50 feet in such weather. Apparently this is common in the summer off of the Upper East Coast. While I'm on the helm, and I hear my boy on the lookout yell something. The captain is on the bridge, which is rare, and is walking about. The first lieutenant goes out and asks what's up. Now we were going about all ahead three, which was slow, but still a lot of momentum for a 270 foot cutter. He yells that a small fishing boat is off our port bow freeze up and look behind me at the cap and my BMC. The captain yells an old command we don't use anymore, all back or something, but I get the drift. Just then, I see it. A 30 foot small fishing vessel off our bow like 50 feet away and closing. Looked like all wood and older in build. Pull the engines from a head three to back eight. Bells ring and the boat swings right and starts to churn water. The fishing boat slides just past our bow and misses by no more than 10 feet. The captain was freaking the fuck out but put his hand on my shoulder and says, You did good, kid, as he turns around and leaves. Rest of watch was kind of stressful, but wow, our steel hull would have obliterated them. Coming up into summer of 05, my dad decided that our family was going to do a once in a lifetime trip. We learned to sail, got all of our certifications, and spent the summer sailing all over the Caribbean on a 40 foot sailboat. Well, 
Turns out August of 05 was a bad time to be in a 40 foot boat in the Bahamas. Katrina came through pretty good and smashed most of everything to hell. We managed to avoid the worst of it, but we spent two days running to a safe harbor to weather the storm in the worst seas I've ever seen. Our boat, an island packet 40 foot, is designed to be a solid ocean going vessel and she handled better than I could have believed, but still we got knocked down a few times. Definitely a night where I wasn't sure if we were going to make it or not. I still sail a bit here and there, but my dad decided that he loved it. Old man in the sea, I guess. He's the skip on the stars and stripes now, sailing for a full-time job. Not out at sea, but on a pretty wide section of the Mississippi River. Was working on a paddle wheel heading north on a seven day journey. I was sound asleep and it was around 4 a.m. that I woke to a sudden jolt that nearly knocked me from my bunk. A split second later, the emergency alarms all went off at which I shot up so fast that I forgot that I had an AC duct over my head. Smacked it so hard I put a massive dent in it. No idea how I didn't knock myself out in the process. Jumped off of my bunk and grabbed my life jacket and was out of my room before I realized I was just in boxers. Ran back in and threw on my shorts and bolted for the deck. Once on deck, I realized that it was foggy and a moonless night. People were freaking out thinking we were sinking and us, the crew, were doing what we could to keep everyone calm not even knowing that it was happening ourselves. Also, the fog was so bad and the night was so dark that no matter how hard we tried, there was no seeing the shore or our surroundings. The freakiest part of it all was knowing that whatever we hit was absolutely massive and no one could see a thing anywhere. The suspense at the time was driving people crazy. In the end, we were all required to stay on deck until the sunrise and thereafter learned that we stuck a barge that was partially sunk. Oh, and then realized we were on a stretch of the Mississippi that was nearly half a mile wide. Anyone who would have jumped and tried to swim absolutely would have not made it. The ocean is a beautiful and thoroughly deadly place. While serving aboard a Navy frigate and weathering a storm a ways off the coast of Nova Scotia, I saw lightning hit the top of a rogue wave that was looming 50 feet over the bow at that moment. It was beautiful, and the instant I saw it, I knew I would never see anything else like that, and I doubt that anyone ever captures a picture like what I saw. There were forks of lightning reaching down into that wave for dozens of feet. It was like looking at a brilliantly glowing mountain of emerald and jade. A brilliantly glowing mountain that was about to fall on you. The instant the lightning faded, the ship plowed into that wave, bow on, and the wave broke over the third level of superstructure, three stories up from the main deck. I was on that third level, and if not for a safety strap, I would have been lost. At that time I had never seen such weather before, over a hundred feet of bow forward of the superstructure speared into that wave and when it broke over the windbreak, I will tell you that you had to have been there. You wouldn't scoff at the carrier sailor's reference to solid water in another post. In navy speak, green water over the bow means that you've got a lot of water breaking over the ship, not just a little foam and spray but water of some noticeable depth. It was like colliding with a wall. The hull rang from the impact and the ship lost almost all forward momentum immediately. The ship began to groan and shudder along her whole length as she shouldered upwards and shed who can tell how many tons of water. There were many other waves that night, but I know which one left the inch wide cracks in the superstructure amidships. I know that the ocean contains beautiful and otherworldly vistas not to be seen anywhere else on this earth. 
and I know the ocean is utterly, utterly lethal. I'm not a sailor, but I almost died. At least it felt like it on a carnival cruise. The captain was an idiot and got too close to a hurricane. The entire boat rocked back and forth to what felt like a 45 degree angle. Very steep to the point we were fighting not to slide down the floor. We had been in the theater on a lower level and after much debate decided to try to walk up the stairs to the deck. We didn't know what was the right thing to do. So much crying and screaming. People were donning life jackets and crew was taking down lifeboats, though none actually went off the side. All of the pools spilled out onto the ocean and all the glass storefronts and most plates broke. Finally, after maybe two hours, the boat was stable and no longer had water covering all the windows. We were stuck on the boat an extra four days. Part boat problems, part Miami port needed to be cleared out. And we were bored to tears because all the stores were closed, pools were empty, and we were given leftover food day after day on what plates remained. Everything smelled like liquor from smashed bottles. Not fun. I'll never forget that first half hour or so where I was sure I was going to go down like the Titanic, but had to pretend it was normal for the sake of the kids. The crew was half helpful and half useless saying, oh, this is normal, which was bullshit. And the captain was really, really useless and didn't even make an announcement until like four to five hours after the incident. No more cruises for me. I was in the US Navy and we were out to sea in the North Atlantic. One of my first times on the ocean. Rough seas caused our captain to secure access to outside the skin of the ship. Being a smoker, I wanted to smoke and the only place to do it was outside the ship. The older engineers I served with told me to just smoke in the engine room like everyone else in these situations or throw in a dip. I thought that was a bad idea and decided to wait until about 2.15 a.m. to sneak out to burn one. It turns out the bad idea was to go out at all. Undogged the door to the aft of the ship and got rocked by a big ass wave. The door had the momentum and I went with it and was headed overboard in cold seas in the middle of the night. My leg caught one of the rails somehow, and the ship rocked the other way, dumping me back on the deck. I jumped inside the ship and dogged down the door as quick as I could. That was the end of my story if Poseidon would have chose different. Would not recommend. I haven't commented in a long while, and it's been very late here, but I feel like I need to tell the story. I was working on a commercial squid boat out of Port of LA. We were anchored on a promising looking spot just off of Catalina Island when the water slowly turned white with the most squid I've ever seen at once. They were so dense it seemed that we could almost walk across the water. So we started pulling our scoop through the massive shoal and winching them into our hold. We were giddy as fuck with the dollar signs in our eyes straining in net with half ton scoops every couple minutes. That's when we realized the deck of our rusty old ship was inches from water level. We stopped immediately and tried not to panic. The holds weren't full and we knew something was seriously wrong. So we went down to the engine room to check the bilge and found that this engine surrounded by mounds of squid with more pouring in by the second. It turns out there was a weak spot in the steel between the shaft alley, the channel where the drive shaft runs between the engine and the propeller, and the fish hold. The weight of the squid had blown a hole through it and allowed several tons of squid to pour into our engine room, which caused our boat to begin sinking. We immediately got on the radio and put out a distress signal. We needed signer with a squid pump to empty our hold. It was the only way we were going to save the boat. 
We hadn't seen any other vessels for quite some time, and there weren't even any light boats within the vicinity, but incredibly, there was one ship that was returning to port carrying a meager hull within range. They answered our call. It was a signer. We were incredibly lucky that night. I'm not even sure how long it took for them to get us. It seemed like forever as we were panicking and hand netting as many squid out of our hold as we could while waves washed over our scuppers. They finally showed up and pumped out about 20,000 worth of squid back into the ocean, saving us from an extremely expensive mistake and a night in our lifeboat. Okay, so I'm pretty late to this party, but I have an unusual story. I was working on a research vessel in the South Pacific in the mid-2000s. I was part of the research crew, but worked closely with the ship's crew. They were all contracted. It was a great group and an interesting project. Among the crew were two twins. I'll call them Kate and Kit. They were total sweethearts of the group and worked in the galley as a steward. So we were doing bottom survey and had vehicles deployed. It would take a while to get up and down, like about 10 hours if I remember correctly. We were just about to start a turn and head in the other direction, think mowing a lawn, when we get word that one of the twins, Kate, is having a seizure. We did have a doctor on board, but obviously this is a pretty serious situation. The crew rallied to help. And Kit filled us in that Kate had seizures before, and that it was probably related to some relationship problems back home. Side note, they were originally from a country that has a cultural belief that seizures are not a medical condition but rather a spirit type experience. So Kate is having these crazy seizures that are lasting like 30 plus minutes. We're down in the lower berths and Kit is assisting the doc and one of the mates who had a ton of practical first responder experience. By this time, we started recovering the vehicle, 10 plus hours, remember, and planning to head to the closest island, a small atoll, which is days southwest so that Kate can be medevaced. I don't mean a chopper, just whatever plane we can get. The US Coast Guard wants nothing to do with us because we're too far from US shores. They are the Coast Guard after all. We split them up so that we could handle them and brought one twin up to another common space. We arranged watch sections, basically to keep them from hurting themselves. They continue seizing throughout the recovery of the vehicles and most of the way to the atoll. They were separated by two levels on a 170 foot ship, couldn't hear each other as ships are loud, but would go in and out of consciousness at the same time. It was like completely surreal. Like twins feels, I guess. We finally got to this small port and got them to a hospital, which the doc declared unfit and worse than on the ship. We had clean needles, so yay. The twins get medevaced and if one of the engines on the planes didn't fail mid-air causing a crazy landing. Sketchy on these details, I wasn't on the plane. To get back to the states and the doctors back there can't find anything wrong with either of them. We stayed on the island for about half a day and got shamelessly drunk. I ate some delicious sushi and came home with a mild case of Hep A, despite having a vaccine. It was totally worth it. I'm a bit late to the game and not my personal experience, but a very good friend of mine was out in his boat off the coast of Western Australia with his dog and another friend. Copped a freak wave to the side that managed to half sink the boat, followed quickly by a second that did the job. Dude has a lot of experience and would never intentionally put himself in a situation like this, but they'd had a good day out and filled their eskies. Bit too much weight on board, and mate let his guard down for a second. He says by the time he acknowledged the first wave, the second was on top of them, and the boat was under in under 30 seconds. Eperb was kept in the stowaway instead of on his person. Biggest mistake. 
and they had no way of retrieving it. So he and his mate were stuck seven kilometers offshore, sitting ducks. Also, his dog was tied to the boat to prevent him from jumping out into the water, and there was no time to free him, so had to say goodbye in that instant. I think this is the point of the incident that has caused a lasting effect. Can't fathom having to watch your best mate get sucked up by the ocean, knowing there's nothing that can be done about it. Apparently he made a few attempts to dive and his friend had to physically stop him because he was putting himself in danger. Anyway, this guy is pretty healthy, has always been very active and a semi-pro free diver. No stranger to the ocean and hard work basically. His mate on the other hand is an average Joe Blow, overweight and not accustomed to the ocean with very little chance of swimming back to shore. So they make the call. Better that he stay in the area and tread water and then tire himself out trying to make it back while my friend tries to get to shore or find another vessel. So during this, mate's partner realizes he isn't back in time and they have a system in place should this ever occur. So she gets on to the authorities, gives them the general location and time they were supposed to be back and they start looking, but to no avail. My mate literally swam seven kilometers in the open ocean to the nearest island. I believe it was a garden island, a naval base located off Perth, over the course of about five hours, to be rescued by a vessel moored on the island. He gave them the coordinates of his mate, they tell authorities, and he gets picked up. Positive end to something that could have been terrible. I know for a fact these guys have never really gotten over this incident. I can't begin to imagine what would have been running through their minds. Thankfully my mate is a very well adjusted person and is generally pretty awesome. Posted this already on reddit somewhere else but this is a good spot for it too. I was a navy sailor who went out to sea many times for weeks at a time. One of my jobs was being a lookout to spot boats, planes, things in the water or air pretty much and report it back to the ship. My lookout rotation could have me standing watch during the day or night, sometimes both and it was during the nights where I was pretty afraid, especially if you were at the back of the ship alone. For anyone who hasn't been out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night should realize you see many more lights in the sky than you would ever in a city. On you know, navy ships, they like to have very little lights on at night. So standing watch at around 1am feels very alien sometimes. During the nights without a bright moon to help with your vision, you may as well be on a different planet. There was this one time I saw a bright green color moving in the water slowly. I didn't know what it was. My mind told me maybe it's a USO or something else. Eventually I was told it was just plankton but it sure looked freaky to someone who wasn't aware of the glowing plankton produces. Another time, me and another guy were standing watch together, and I decided to look up during 2am and see what things I could come across in the midnight sky. I would see meteors streak across the sky, but a couple times there were bright lights moving slowly way out there. Perhaps a satellite, maybe who knows but I stared for a good 20 minutes in the sky and encountered approximately 15 of those slow moving lights in different areas of the sky, perhaps many millions of miles apart. Either way, those were the few times I saw for myself how vast space really is and that there was so much unknowns out there that humans have yet to discover or explain. At the tail end of my first deployment, the ship stopped in Virginia to unload ammunition and to take on family members for a Tiger cruise. We were going from Norfolk, VA to Jacksonville, Florida, so it would only be for a few days. During the transit, we hit some heavy seas. This combined with the ballast problem we've been having that was causing the ship to list noticeably means we were rolling quite a bit. At the time, I was in deck division which means my watch rotation included standing aft lookout. 
Aft Lookout's main job is to stand at the back of the ship with a headset and watch for anyone that may have fallen overboard. Normally, while in heavy seas or bad weather, we would have moved the aft lookout to the helo tower, but with all the civilians on board, the captain felt we needed to keep careful watch. So whether or no, the aft lookout had to stay put. So sometimes in the wee hours of the morning, I'm standing watch on the bridge, waiting to rotate to aft lookout. I keep hearing complaints from them, saying it's very wet, asking to be moved to the tower and being denied every time. Finally, it's my turn and I find myself standing in the dark cold rain, the ship rolling heavily beneath me. We were a good sized ship, but waves regularly sweeping across the deck, roughly ankle deep. To keep my socks from getting soaked, whenever I'd see a wave coming, I'd hop up on the slightly higher harpoon launchers and hold on since they were a little slick. Everything is going relatively well until a much bigger wave comes out of nowhere. I immediately jumped up and assumed my wave position, knowing full well my wet socks were the least of my worries. I wrapped my arms around the launcher tightly as the swell swept through chest deep. I have no doubt that it would have taken me with it had I not grabbed onto the harpoon launcher and no one would have known for at least an hour when the next rotation came to relieve me. On a 41-foot sailboat in the middle of Chesapeake Bay, with about seven other men doing a shakedown and a test cruise, planned to be out for about 12 hours. Mid-1980s, not as reliable weather prediction resources, we get caught in a tropical storm, winds gusting into the 50 miles per hour range, just this short of a weak hurricane. We had just barely rigged storm hawsers and storm sails because the one fellow on board who was the best sailor sensed the storm was almost among us. Otherwise, we would have died. During the storm itself, I expected to die at any time. In fact, we made a security, security call on the radio. If you have time at sea, you know what I'm talking about. If not, it's not that important. For what seemed like 15 minutes, we were in a maelstrom, no visibility, but then it passed. We would live. This was at about 3 p.m. Although there was cloud cover, of course, the ambient light was such that you could see two miles or so in any direction. If you're familiar with the sea, you know that such storms, particularly in shallower depths near land masses, dredge a lot of things of the sea floor. We're all on deck, working lines, checking damage, etc. And the bay around us is choppy and churning and foaming. Old timey sailors often use the saying, the sea is confused. I look about 15 feet of the starboard side and something swims to the surface, breaks the surface, looks at us, then submerges again. It was like a thin man with humanoid shape Arms articulated like a man, a human head, but its skin was covered in scales like a snake. It looked at us, blinked its weird, heavy-lidded eyes, then dove back under. So maybe you need to know a few things about me at that moment. No drugs, no alcohol, no injuries. I was elated because I was glad to be alive, but my senses in that situation were sharpened, not dulled. I had, at the time, about six years experience on ships and fishing boats and had seen squid, octopi, flying fish, sharks, skates, etc. all around the world. I was not the type of guy to see a patch of seaweed and call it a sea monster. I made an instant decision that I was not going to say anything. What could I say? I just saw a strange creature? Take my word for it. The men on this boat were all mechanics and engineers and professionals. Why get a reputation as a flake? At the time it was important for each of us to get D skipper or OOD qualifications and saying something like that would be frowned upon. 
As I stood there, my life vest, soaking wet, hooked onto the steel lifeline, glad to be alive, one of the other sailors, a USN captain with over 30 years experience in the surface navy, piped up and said, I just saw a brown thing pop up on the surface. It looked like a lizard man with a scaly face. He blinked at us with these big eyes and then went back under. Yeah, I saw it too, I said. No one else said that they had seen it. Then we sailed back to the pier later that day and didn't speak of it again. <laughs>